My message this morning is a very simple message. It's titled, How Not to Build a Conservatory. <laughs> Sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? About 23 years ago, the Lord very graciously moved into the house that we live in now, and we just love it. It was just a very special way that the Lord gave us the home, so we always knew that this was where we were meant to live. But in our conservatory, or sorry, in our lounge, which is quite long, we were aware right from the start that whoever had built the house had obviously intended to have a conservatory at the end of the lounge, because when you got to the end of the lounge, there was two wooden and glass doors that opened up into about six steps going down into grass. It just ended wrongly. And, uh, but of course, just moving into a new house, we were stretched financially. We had, there was no way we could afford to do that. So over the next a couple of years, occasionally I would say to the Lord, Lord, should we get a conservatory? Can we get a conservatory? Would it be wise? Can I afford it, etc.? One day, during my quiet time and my lunch hour in work, the Lord suddenly spoke to me and said, build a conservatory. The work will start on the sixth month and will finish on the eighth month. What a strange thing. So I phoned Linda very excitedly and said, the Lord says we're to have a conservatory. And so excitedly I contacted three local conservatory suppliers and they came with their various plans. But our garden at the back was an odd shape because where the doors opened there was about a lot of steps down and then the garden sloped down. So it meant whoever built a conservatory in line with the lounge floor would have had to put about six steps down to the grass, which had been quite dangerous. So the other, so two of the coats went for the cheapest option, just build it and have about six steps down to the garden, which had been dangerous for children, etc. But one company said, you really need to do this right. If we build up the foundation, we'll have to build up the garden and build a patio there. So there's only two steps from the conservatory and then another two steps down from the edge of the patio and then two more steps down. And that made sense. But of course, they were the, that was the most expensive option. And they said that would be £10,000. Now, that's a lot of money now, but some 23 years ago, if we can remember, that was a lot of money. So I contacted my bank and I said if I add £10,000 onto my mortgage how much will that cost thinking that's the way we'll do it but when he came back with how much was added on I was quite shocked I thought that would really really put us under pressure so now I'm, I'm a bit confused why the Lord said yes go ahead when I can't actually afford it so I, I was a, a director in the company I was in and We'd always told our accountant, you know, at the end of the year, keep enough money from any bonuses or salary. So as when the income tax comes in, we're not, you have it set aside for us. So anyway, about two or three days after this going to the bank, our accountant walks into my office and says, I have a pleasant surprise for you. The tax laws have changed and I've been holding some money back for you to, for your taxes and I don't need it now. And I said, how much? What do you think he said? <laughs> £10,000. Well, wow. So um, I phoned up this company and I said, yes, we like your plans and we accept your quote. And he said, look, we're very busy at the minute. We can't start the work until June. And we can't finish it until August. So we're on, we're on a good straight line so far. Lord says, build it. Lord provides to the penny, gives me the months it starts and finishes, and that's how it works out. So what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? So they came along and they, and they, 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 they built the foundation about this height off the ground with uh, a couple of steps going down, and they built up the whole patio work, which was a very, very good job. And then in August they came back and they built this beautiful conservatory. And we were really, really pleased with it. It looked very, very good. But because it was August, um, Northern Ireland thought it was summertime and it didn't rain for a couple of days. Um, <laughs> but a couple of days after it was up, it started to rain and we came down in the morning and uh, we didn't have a conservatory. We had a swimming pool. Um, 
<laughs> so I got on to the conservative company and I said, look, um, we have a flood. So I said, oh, uh, we mustn't have sealed some of the joints correctly. So they came down and, by golly, they sealed the joints. You, even to this day, the amount of sealant they put on it is, is like, wow. <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, fair enough, fair enough. A couple of days later, it rained, and we came down in the morning, and we had a swimming pool. So I got on to them again and said, oh, it must be the brickwork was before the, the plastic starts. There's brickwork about this height, and then brickwork away down to the bottom of the garden. They said, the bricks must have soaked, and the rain has come through. So we'll come down, and we'll spray this, this uh, clear sealant all over the bricks. So they did. They came down, and they spread it, and sprayed it, and sprayed it thought, right, well, that's certainly rainproof. A couple of days later, it rained, and we had a swimming pool. So I got on to them again and said, we still have a swimming pool. And he said, OK, look, I, I, I'm pretty certain I, I know how to fix this. So he said, we need a, a day at it. We'll come down on Saturday and fix it. So I said, look, we'll be away all day Saturday. I'll leave the key for you. So we came back at 6 o'clock and I was taking stuff into the kitchen. Linda went into the conservatory and she sort of came walking with eyes open into the kitchen and said, Ken, come and see what they've done. So I went in and they had an iron bar bolted across it into two sides and a big bolt in the middle painted white. And I looked at it as if like, am I seeing this? And I touched it. And I looked at it, I just literally, I, I, not often I'm speechless, but I was actually speechless. <laughs> and this passionate anger rose in me. I'm not, trust me, I am not an angry person. I very rarely would ever get angry. I, I'm just, I'm a cool dude. But, but I got angry. And I went to the phone. Of course, it was ten past six on a Saturday night. Nobody there. You get a, a, a girl answering phone. But that didn't stop me because I had to vent. I said, you come down here and you take that ugly, ugly iron pole out of my conservatory. You come down, etc., etc., etc. Et et so I thought, calm down, Ken. Have a cup of tea. You've left your complaint. So I went and had a cup of tea, but I found this magnet pulling me back into the conservatory to have another look. Next thing down goes the cup of tea, back to the phone again. <laughs> the same, man, how dare you do it? Oh. So Linda says, Ken, calm down. You've protested twice. They've got, they'll get the idea. So I tried to watch the television. I tried everything, but 9 o'clock at night, I went in and th thought, maybe I'm overreacting. No, I'm not. Back to the phone again, <laughs> Jose. So anyway, Sunday came, and of course, you know, you quieten down a bit. Monday morning, I'm brushing my teeth. Linda opens the bathroom and says, uh, it's the conservative company for you. <laughs> so, of course, by now, I'm sort of I'm feeling... Mildly foolish, right, but mildly foolish, thinking maybe I could have handled that better. So I said, uh, <clears throat> good morning. He said, <clears throat> good morning. And uh, he said, um, so you don't like the iron bar? Um, I think it was a word of knowledge. That, that <laughs> and I said, I said, no, I do not like the iron bar, and I want it removed. He said, look, I need to tell you, it should have been there in the first place. It was our mistake not putting it in. I said, I don't believe you. I mean, I, I'm no expert in conservatives, but I just said, I'm sorry, I just don't believe you. And he said, a conservative your size actually needs an iron bar to stabilize it. And I said, no, we have looked at conservatives much larger than ours in the area, and they don't have an iron bar, so I just don't believe you. So I would not let it go. I just would not let it go. So eventually he said, OK, we'll come down on Saturday and we'll fix it, I promise. I said, OK. So I said, guess what? We're away all day Saturday. I'll leave the key. So we both came in at 6 o'clock at night and we very nervously headed towards the conservatory and opened it and there was no iron bar, not even holes where the iron bar had been. And it, it looked the same as before, but... And the rain was just gently starting. So before we went to bed at night, we looked and it was dry. But it rained heavily all night, so we came down in the morning and it was dry.
and it rained the next night and it was dry. So I went to the phone and I picked up the phone and I think he dreaded answering it. <laughs> but I said, look, I was very passionate uh, whenever it was leaking, but I said, it's not leaking and you've done a good job. So I just want to say thank you very much. Good job. So that sort of took all the sting out of it. And he suddenly said, you were right, you know. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, the iron bar was never meant to be there. I said, well, it's very honest of you to tell me. He says, no. He said, we didn't build it accurately enough. And the walls were out a little bit like that. And so the door wasn't closing properly. And so the rain was getting in. So we just artificially pulled it in to get the door framed to close. And I said, well, how did you do it without the iron bar then? He said, we had to strip it right down to the foundation and we had to get the manufacturer's handbook and we had to build it exactly, exactly to the specifications. <laughs> Is it our fault entirely? I said, well, that's very honest of you and thank you. So, happy days, but I'm confused. The Lord has set this place and now I have had all this, all this going on, this stress and this... Oh. So, that night I... In my prayer time, I said, Lord, thank you so much for the conservatory. We, we love it. It finishes the house off nicely. But what went wrong? I wasn't expecting the Lord to speak to me. I was sort of just, as you do. But he did speak to me. And what he said, I have never forgotten. And I have my quiet time in the conservatory every morning. So it lives with me all the time. He said, I give you permission to be as righteously angry when you see my church not being built according to my instructions. Today we know that a great many churches in Europe and North America have abandoned the clear wording in the manufacturer's handbook, the Bible, and have absorbed and agreed with much of the culture's revised thinking on morality. And guess what? These are the churches that are leaking the most. Dave Shiflett, an established reporter and author, he's written for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Investors Business Daily, and among other major media. He's the author of Christianity on Trial and is a member of the White House Writers Group. And he wrote this, Americans are, vac are vacating progressive pews and flocking to churches that offer more traditional versions of Christianity. Most people go to church to get something they cannot get elsewhere. This consuming public, people who already believe or who are attempting to believe, who want their children to believe, go to church to learn about the mysterious truth on which the Christian religion is built. They want the good news, not the minister's political views or intellectual coaching. The latter creates sprawling vacancies in the pews. Indeed, those empty pews can be considered the earthly reward for abandoning heaven traditionally understood. And Glen Mary Research Center Director Ken Sanchegrin told the New York Times that he was astounded to see that by and large the growing churches are those that are ordinary called, ordinarily called conservative and when I looked at those that were declining, most were moderate or liberal churches. And the more liberal the, de the denomination by most people's definition, the more they were losing. In other words, the more they were leaking. In other words, the more liberal the doctrine, the more the church leaks. But here's where I'm going with this. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You know the verse, Matthew 16, 18. He did not say he would build our culturally and morally adjusted version of his church. The following are extracts from Psalm 119. Let's see what we think God might be saying. Verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to to your word. Verse 25, revive me according to your word. Verse 28, strengthen me according to your word. Verse 41, let your mercies come all through to me, O Lord, your salvation according 
to your word. Verse 58, be merciful to me according to your word. Verse 65, you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Verse 76, let I pray your merciful kindness be for my comfort according to your word. Verse 107, again, it says, revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Verse 116, uphold me according to your word. And again, revive me according to your word. Verse 54. Verse 169, give me understanding according to your word. Verse 170, deliver me according to your word. Not the world's word. Not liberal theologians' word, but according to your word, Lord. When we come to the New Testament, we find the same. Luke one thirty eight. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Luke 2.29. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. You see, it's all about the word. Jesus lived by the word because, of course, he was, is, and always will be the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And since Jesus is the word and, of course, the truth, it's obvious that everything must be done according to the word. God is looking for leaders who will be co-workers in building his church according to his word. Type the word of God into the NIV New Testament search engine and you'll find it's mentioned 36 times. Type in the word And the total jumps to 94 mentions. So you can't escape it. And only the word of God is alive and active. As Hebrews 4.12 says, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Well, people who like their sin don't like being judged according to the thoughts and attitudes of their heart. I agree with Egyptian Dr. Michael Youssef when he says, every time the church of Jesus Christ departs from living under the authority of scripture, Islam expands, but I would extend that to read, every time the church of Jesus Christ departs from living under the authority of scripture, spiritual darkness in every area increases. Darkness cannot exist in light. God is looking for leaders who will be co-workers in building his church according to his word. And back to Psalm 119, verse 130, declares that the entrance of God's word gives light and gives understanding. But today, the popular culture not only rejects the word of God, but believes that instead of it bringing light, they say it's bringing darkness. So as Christians, we say that according to the word, Killing babies in the womb is moral darkness. The culture says, no, it is enlightenment. We say that according to the word, men having sex with men and women with women is moral darkness. The culture says, no, it is enlightenment. We say that according to the word, marriage, which is anything other than a man marrying a woman, is moral darkness. The culture says, no, it is enlightenment. God is looking for leaders who will be co-workers in building his church according to the word. Many believe that Christians who live according to the world are narrow-minded while they themselves are broad-minded. And there is some truth in that, in that accusation because according to the word, Jesus calls people to enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter it. The narrow way is the way of life. Where churches courageously seek to build Christ's church according to the word, their lampstand will keep burning brightly even in the deepest darkness. Charisma magazine writer Michael Brown in an article titled The Real Reason Liberal Churches Are Losing Members 
said, Bible-based, spirit-filled churches that hold to conservative moral values are outgrowing all other religious expressions, as the respected statistician David Barrett has documented for more than three decades. When people truly encounter the Lord, they will gladly forsake everything and follow him. God is looking for leaders who will be co-workers in building his church according to his word. You see, the Old and the New Testament affirm that God does not do mixtures. He will not permit anything but faith and obedience to be mixed in with his word. Churches that choose to mix God's hot tap with the world's cold tap will leak dramatically. Last week, I read, under great pressure from the culture, another denomination has announced its plans to revisit the church's definition of marriage via a re-examination of theology. We all know that that is not the word of God leading that. That is pressure from the culture. That is mice responding instead of men. Next to the Bible, most people know that the writings that have shaped me most have been those of that great man of God, Aidan Wilson Tozer. I read Tozer every morning after I've read the Bible and, and uh, what a man of God. This short extract, I think he nails it completely, is entitled, We Need Men of God Again. The church at this moment needs men, the right kind of men, bold men. The talk is that we need revival, that we need a new baptism of the Spirit, and God knows we must have both, but God will not revive mice. He will not fill rabbits with the Holy, the Holy Ghost. We languish for men who feel themselves expendable in the warfare of the soul, who cannot be frightened by threats of death because they have already died to the allurements of this world. Such men will be free from the compulsions that control weaker men. They will not be forced to do things by the squeeze of circumstances. Their only compulsion will come from within or from above. This kind of freedom is necessary if we are to have prophets in our pulpits instead of mascots. These free men will serve God and mankind for motives too high to be understood by the rank and file of religious retainers who today shuttle in and out of the sanctuary. They will make no decisions out of fear, take no course out of a desire to please, accept no service for financial considerations, perform no religious act out of mere custom, nor will they allow themselves to be influenced by the love of publicity or their desire for reputation. Much that the church, even the evangelical church, is doing these days, she is doing because she is afraid not to. Ministerial associations take up projects for no higher reason than they are being scared into it. Whatever their ear to the ground, fear-inspired reconnoitering leads them to believe the world expects them to do, they will be doing come next Monday morning with all kinds of trumped-up zeal and show of godliness. The pressure of public opinion calls these prophets, not the voice of Yahweh. The true church has never sounded out public expectations before launching her crusades. Her leaders heard from God and went ahead wholly independent of popular support or the lack of it. They knew their Lord's will and they did it and their people followed them, sometimes to triumph, oftener to insults and public persecution. And their sufficient reward was the satisfaction of being right in a wrong world. Another characteristic of the true prophet has been love. The free man who has learned to hear God's voice and dared to obey it has felt the moral burden that broke the hearts of the Old Testament prophets, crushed the soul of our Lord Jesus Christ and wrung streams of tears from the eyes of the apostles. The free man has never been a religious tyrant, nor has he sought to lord it over God's heritage. It is fear and lack of self-assurance that has led men to try to crush others under their feet. These have had some interest to protect, some position to secure, so they have demanded subjection from their followers as a guarantee of their own safety. But the free man, never. He has nothing to protect, no ambition to pursue, no enemy to fear. 
For that reason, he is completely careless of his standing among men. If they follow him, well and good. If not, he loses nothing that he holds dear. But whether he is accepted or rejected, he will go on loving his people with sincere devotion. And only death can silence his tender intercession for them. Yes, if evangelical Christianity is to stay alive, she must have men again. The right kind of men. She must repudiate the weaklings who dare not speak out. She must seek in prayer and much humility the coming again of men of the stuff prophets and martyrs are made of. God will hear the cries of his people as he heard the cries of Israel in Egypt. And he will send deliverance by sending deliverers. It is his way among men. And when the deliverers come, reformers, revivalists, prophets, they will be men of God and men of courage. They will have God on their side because they will be careful to stay on God's side. They will be co-workers with Christ and instruments in the hand of the Holy Ghost. Such men will be baptized with the Spirit indeed and through their labors. He will baptize others and send the long delayed revival. God is looking for leaders who will be co-workers in building his church according to his word. Amen.